Um, I, I am thrilled to be part of this. I've been part of GLSs in my previous role. Uh, I'll show you in a second here. Um, but I've always said to people that these co conferences are some of the best thought leadership discussions that I've been part of. I've gone to countless case conferences and academic impressions and you name it. Um, all good, you learn stuff every time, and you learn stuff through the informal networking more than anything else, the connections you make at a conference. Uh, but this is some of the best content I've seen, and uh, hopefully I can add to that today. Um, and I think you will see as over the course of today and tomorrow, we have some really cool sessions uh, with a couple different panel discussions, a fireside chat. Gary Olson is here to talk about what the case organization on, uh, is doing on alumni engagement metrics. So you'll get a really a current view of what's happening in the industry, and I'm excited to be part of it. So let's dive in. A little bit about me. So my first part of my career, I spent 12 years as the head men's and women's swimming coach at Lehigh University. And people go, well, so what, what does that matter? Well, from this, I gathered, I gained competitiveness. <laughs> I gained the ability to recruit. Because most people think that coaching, you're standing there telling people to swim fast. Most people don't know that the, if you're in athletics, most of the work you do is recruiting people to come and be part of that. And that's part of managing a group and leading a team. Um, but then the other part is the appreciation for metrics. In this particular sport, you measure to the hundredth of a second. Right? And we have a scoreboard at the end of the competition. And when I got into alumni relations, my next gig was I literally walked across campus. And for seven years, I was the executive director of the Alumni Association. And I said, how do we know what success looks like? And I didn't get an answer. I didn't have, at that point in 2001, in fact, it was September 10th, 2001 was my first day on the job. Um, September 11th at Lehigh, we lost 14 alums on 9-11. So it was a really interesting start of that part of my career. Um, but as I began into those first early months, we didn't have a scoreboard. And the industry really didn't have a set standard. And what the, you'll hear from tomorrow, where we're headed with this, it's really come a long way. And I think we're in a position to get there. I left Lehigh in 08 and went to Cornell University, spent almost five years there as the Associate Vice President for Alumni Affairs, is what they called it, in an advancement structure, um, AA and D, Alumni Affairs and Development, so we were all part of the same big team. Then I joined GG&A and spent almost five years with them. Anybody know Grenzebach, Galeer and Associates? I've met some clients here in the room, some of you we've worked with before. GG&A is a uh, consulting company that works out of Chicago, and I spent five years with them, working with over 110 clients. Um, and this is where I got a little bit, in the first two stops, I was in higher ed, private, you know, large, medium-sized institutions. With GG&A, we started with that same group, but we ended up working with UCLA and Penn State and some very large public universities, four or 500,000 alumni, all the way down through some, we had about eight or nine K through 12 clients. So I got a sense of the alumni engagement spectrum in, uh, from across the, the, you know, a staff of 70 down to a staff of one, and what it means to resource an alumni engagement program anywhere in between that, and how these practices all apply. And then, of course, I joined Graduate August 1st, so I have all of 0.1 years <laughs> of experience with this product. Now, one of the things that I really liked about the role uh, Daniel created for me was that I'm not a sales pitch man, go in and hard, you know, get people to, you know, twist arms until they get them to buy the product. It's to help figure out strategically how the product can work in the context of an alumni engagement program. And that's why I'm on board here. Um, and the connections I have to other people in the industry is another part of it as well. So I'm busy trying to learn the product and learn the detail, but I'm spending most of my time making connections and helping clients figure out how does this tool work strategically in the work they do in alumni engagement. So there's my career in five quick bullets. Um, today, we're going to talk about trends that I've seen, and really most, mostly coming out of this past five years. These existed in the past. But um, in the past five years with gg &A, these four I chose came up over and over and over again. And we did a lot of the work in these four areas. You'll see that in a moment, um, what those are. Uh, there are dozens of other trends I could have chosen. I chose these four to talk about today, which I think are important for us to have on our radar. The end product is that if you're in the room, I just want you to sort of do a self-check. How am I doing in these four areas? Am I on pace? Am I doing what I should be in these four? Strategic planning, the, the, the notion of mutual value. You've heard this being talked a lot most recently. For me, I've heard this more than ever in the last three years, which is, We've always asked alumni to do things for alma mater. What can, we, what can alma mater do for the alumni, and how do we make that 
value proposition clear from the beginning. So that's something that people are talking a lot more about and very transparently and explicitly. Accountability, this gets right into the metrics the question we'll talk about, but there's some more pieces that come with that. And then integration, integration within an advancement department, integration within a university setting or within a uh, K through 12 setting, whatever you might be in. Those are the four that we're gonna ch check on today. And the standards for this presentation, I wanna make sure this is clear. This is part opening keynote to get things going, but I want it to be interactive. So if you have a question or a comment as we go along, just raise your hand, shout it out. There are microphones on either side. You can come down and stand and happy to address questions as we go. And the second bullet here is I think an important one. This is not going to be a graduate commercial throughout. There's enough branding that you know you're at graduate. We're talking now what's happening in the industry. What I've seen over five years at 110 clients, dozens of potential trends, I pulled four out that I thought were worth us talking about today. I'm also gonna keep track of time so we can make sure we get to the next thing, Daniel, and I think we're gonna be doing fine here. So before we dive in, just a quick check on what I look at as sort of the past, a little one or two slides on the past, a little bit about what I look at as a modern program today, and then we're gonna spend the time talking about the future, these trends that I see coming that many of you are already addressing, and I just noticed now that we spelt the word agenda wrong on our slide. <laughs> I just wanna go on record, I had it right when I sent it in to the designers. Damn it. Daniel, killing me. <laughs> so the past. Um, you should know, many of you know this, and there's some schools in this room that have had this. There are examples in the 1800s of volunteer groups organizing themselves, usually around class years, to form a reunion in 1850-something is the earliest one I've heard. Anybody here have an example of an earlier one at their institution? Where? where? Give us. 1781, he says, with the with the proper accent too. Where, give, us the, give us a little detail behind that. Go ahead. It's meeting of that line from tomorrow. Oh, then I want that. Keep it, keep it. Wow. So in the U.S., 18-something, but you are from, where are you? Manchester. Manchester, right. So there are examples even older, obviously. Anybody else, anybody else have an old example they can share where these groups self-organized and started doing things on their own? And what happened in the early 1900s, you started to see positions being formed that are now associate vice presidents, sometimes even vice presidents, but executive director, these big titles. Originally, they were called alumni secretaries. The person who had the staff position in the university context that was in charge of alumni relations was the alumni secretary, and they formed an association. They got together in 1913, took a picture of 40 of them standing on the steps at the University of Illinois, and 100 years later, they, they are now what we call CASE. If you remember back in 2013, we had the 100 year anniversary of alumni relations. That was a celebration of that beginning of that journey there. Then you see these regional groups forming around large cities, regional clubs and chapters. You of course have public models which are distinct from the private models. Often in the public you have a 501c3, separate legal independent structure. That's a legal term if you're not from the US. Separate alumni associations, separate foundations. These were the norm in many institutions and the large public side. On the private side, you usually saw this advancement structure where you had alumni relations, development, and marketing communications all part of an advancement team. That was the norm as we got into the, where we are today, basically. You also had this notion of friend raisers over here and the fundraisers over here and the two shall never meet. Anybody heard that expression before? I hate that term, friend raising personally, but that's where there's a large period of our history as an industry where that was the prevailing mentality and this notion of touching the third rail of development and fundraising was, was something that people shied away from. They didn't want to go there. Today, it's much more embraced. And then you have this notion of independence, interdependent, and dependent. Uh, what I mean by that is, if you're not clear on it, it um, back in the 1980s, 90s even, in the US, there were over 200 completely independent alumni associations separate legally and financially from their university. All right, so they had a legal structure, 501c3, and they raised all their money through corporate sponsorships, mostly membership dues, and credit card programs, and travel and all that. Today, that number is less than 10, because most of those have moved into an interdependent model where the university is saying, hey, alumni association, it's important that you're engaging our alumni, we're gonna invest in your program and provide money. They still call it the alumni association. They're still legally separate, but they are interdependent in their model. And then their schools like where I worked at, at Cornell where the whole operation is dependent on the advancement structure of the university, where you're just part, you're a department of the university essentially. That's kind of where we come from today. 
if I had to boil down again, there's subtleties around all this, and not everybody has every one of these. If you don't have something here, that's totally fine. There's usually a good reason. Some places just don't do class. Class uh, structure doesn't make sense. But usually what I see is programming or communications or volunteer management. Those are usually the big three focused on class, region, affinity groups. So this would be the identity groups. Um, uh, other interests they may have, professional or, and even student base. These are the things they did while they were students that they want to stay together with now. Affinity. Uh, more in the recent last 15, 20 years, you see this increased focus on young alumni, student alumni, student engagement. Everybody know that Facebook, roughly 2003, changed the game for us because prior to that, um, you could... Um, in order to organize an event or send out a communication or to work with volunteers, you needed the alumni office to be able to tell you who they all were. Starting in 2003 and then to the present, we've been disintermediated. They don't need us now to do a lot of that work. They do it themselves through LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and countless other social media sites. Um, so the, the, the young alumni part is a particularly important one and a challenge for a lot of us. They're very transient. They're on social media. We don't have their addresses, et cetera, et cetera. Email is passe, right? <laughs> Hard to get them to even read it. Um, and then student, working with students while they're in school. A couple other things about presence. So volunteer management, you see that quite a bit. There's titles for people, that's what they do. Marketing, communications, digital engagement. This is a huge, um, I would you put that in a trend category, but certainly established in many institutions as well. Um, techno technology platforms like a graduate, there's lots of them out there, but people are using these now to help manage and scale their alumni engagement. The old model is one-to-one -one staff driven. It got to be a little more volunteer driven. A technology platform allows that to be released and go to the masses. You can have tens of thousands of people using and engaging with a platform in a way. And then this metrics we talked about at the beginning and you'll hear more about throughout the conference. So the future, we're going to use these as our icons to mark the strategic planning, the mutual value proposition, the accountability, and the integration issue that we're going to spend just a few slides on each of these. And I have a couple screenshots of examples of schools that are doing this well. Daniel, will we make slides available to folks? Do we usually yeah. put them up? Yeah. 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 So if you're taking notes or taking, I saw a few people taking, if you're taking pictures of me, go ahead, go for it. But if you're taking pictures of the screen because you're trying to capture or write all this down, we will send it to you. So don't feel like you have to get every single word down here. So let's start with strategic planning. I think this has been going on forever. I mean, if you're in the business and you know anything about, you know, thinking about long term and vision and structure, then you've been doing this for a while. But I'm going to present a model that we used in the consulting world that I thought was helpful. It helps also when you think about how do you work with the board around strategic planning. I'll show you that. And I'm going to show you something we, uh, that Duke has done and that Pepperdine has done, just as a couple of examples. It'll be like this for all four of these quick examples, some high-level stuff. I'm not going to get into the detail. Any single one of these could be an hour-long talk, but I want to give you a flavor of what I saw over these past five years. And again, you're, you're sort of doing a self-check. Where am I on this? Have I, do I have a strategic plan? Or do I have an annual plan? Or do I have an annual work plan that I don't even think about what's going to happen the next year, what I have found in strategic planning, for example, is that most places we came upon, even some sophisticated schools, which you would have expected differently, when I asked for a copy of their strategic plan, they gave me what they're doing this year. And I asked and say, well, what is the next two, three, four, five years are hard, but I think three years is the right threshold. What does that look like? And they don't have it. A lot of places just don't have that, that sort of mentality of thinking of the future. In fact, I would argue that there is a one of the uh, challenges our industry faces is that there is a, a binder mentality at times where people take out the binder, open it up, and repeat what they did last year. And to me, that's going to work for a period of time, but eventually some of those things are going to stop working. And a strategic plan helps you get out of the, what did we do last year? Or, you know, you, you know the old, well, we, we've always done it that way. If someone who worked with me ever said that sentence, they pretty much ran out of the office as soon as it was over because they knew what I was going to do when it was over because I just didn't want to hear that. If that's the best way, yeah, let's keep doing it. But just because you've always done it doesn't mean it's the right thing. But strategic planning. Um, here's a model for consideration. Often universities have a set of values or principles that guide what the university stands for, and I would always argue that you should build a plan around that at the beginning. And then we have this structure right here. How's that? Can you read it okay? We were trying to play around with the font and colors and whatnot, but I think it's pretty close. So a strategic plan to me should start with a vision, have a mission, have priorities and objectives and goals. 
and they get down into strategies, tactics, action plans. This is often what we see. When I ask someone for a strategic plan, they would often give me this, right? They don't have any of this stuff. So when it comes to a board, so when we, we work with a, a client back in my old world on a strategic plan, we would start up at the top of this pyramid, sit with a group in a retreat-like format for a couple of days and build out, talk about, they may have a vision, let's just check in on it, is it the right thing? Same thing with mission. Sometimes we were tweaking and rewriting those and working our way down. But if you're working with a board on this, if the board is taking, here's my own personal opinion here, and others may disagree, but here's where I come in on this. If your board is driving your strategic planning process and telling you what to do, we got it flipped around. I think the staff should be leading the strategic planning process and getting the board involved at the top of the pyramid here, right here, on the where to focus. Vision, mission, priorities, the word I like to use, objectives, some people use. Some people call those the goals and those blend together there. It's fine, this is just the model that we used. So in a, in a context of a retreat, I would do a retreat with a group of the alumni leaders. If you're in a large university, for example, you might have the head of the central program and some of the unit-based people, and then several members of the board, and you're sitting together in a retreat like for a day and a half talking about these three things at the top. The rest of it is the job of the paid staff. It's how to succeed. What are the goals, strategies, tactics, and action plans, metrics, and what are the resources required? And there's a term I use when I'm with a board who's struggling with this issue. I just was working with a client right before I switched over to this role. And their challenge was is their board was down in that blue line at the bottom. And there's an old saying that goes, a good board should have their noses in but their fingers out. Right? Just think about the posture of that, what that means, right? Looking in and seeing how's it going, but they're not getting their hands in on, hey, that event happened over there in Toledo, we should have had it down the street in the other block, or, you know, <laughs> that's not the job. But yet, I have a client, I had a client, whose alumni board president was editing the emails and the website for them. And I said, that is hands all over. I mean, get that person out of there. So they started, what happened in that case, they started using the language the alumni director started saying to the board president, noses in, fingers out. And the board president went, okay, I got it, back off. That was a sort of a tool for them. So they started using this pyramid, this triangle really, uh, for where they want the board's input, where they want the board's involvement. But it was just a good model we like to use and I present it to you today as a thought point, really. Anybody in the midst of strategic planning right now? Any of this stuff resonating with you in terms of where the, has it got board playing a role in your plan? Yeah, you're, hey Jason, how are you doing? How are you, by the way? Good to see you, I just first, yeah, how about you? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, the old tail wagging the dog, and sometimes the board thinks that's their role. They think that the, the staff getting involved in this is the, is the wrong way around, and I come in as the outside guy going, no, you're the tail, they're the dog, <laughs> that's how it works. Um, but controversial sometimes, especially if you're in a, anybody in here in, a, uh, in one of those institutions that has a completely separate legal and financial alumni program, alumni association from the mothership institution. Anybody in here following that model? A couple hands are up here. So you could get into some differences here where, where that's the model, where the board actually may play a more governance and fiduciary role and go down further onto this chart here for you. So, there's a subtle difference, but the majority of institutions are going to fall in that model I was talking about. I want to move on or otherwise Daniel's going to give me the hook. Here's Duke. They had uh, five pillars, they called them. Priorities would be the language I would use. But they talked about a couple of things here that you're going to hear throughout um, my presentation and throughout your couple of days here in the other sessions. They wanted to build their own dynamic alumni network platform. Internal, in-house, built their own thing. Um, regional presence was another big focus for them. They have a very diverse alumni population all over the world. So um, it's not like their alumni were all right there in the triangle. They're all over the place, so they needed to have a, a network of uh, chapters and clubs that were helping support and convey the message. Um, they wanted to move into this notion of investment education and forever learning. This is another big trend. This could have been on my list easily. We could have been talking about that for an hour easily. Um, student engagement. This is a priority for them. They started using the tagline for their undergraduate students. When you come to Duke, it's not just four years, it's forever. 
that early seed planting of being part of the Duke family was something they used right away. They had T-shirts made up and everything with it. And then they were building a building. You know, so this was a, when I looked at this, I said, wow, they're, they're doing everything. They're building their own platform, building a building, and doing all these programmatic things in the middle. There's no place else that's going at, going at it uh, this aggressively. And then recently, you worked with Pepperdine University on building theirs. And they, theirs pretty much follows the uh, pyramid that we saw before, vision. Let me just read a couple of the words here. To be a community that fosters loyalty, goodwill, and excellence in alumni and alma mater. Mission. Engage alumni in a mutually beneficial partnership. The next section we're going to talk about is mutual value. Problems. They're putting it right there in their mission and saying to everybody, this is part of what we believe we should be delivering. That generates meaningful connections and strengthens the Pepperdine community. And there are three priorities. They kept it, we debated for two days over language and wordsmith and you name it on this. And they boiled down you know, dozens of flip charts and whiteboard work to three priorities and to these words. Cultivate a vibrant and robust community that engages alumni purposefully, personally, and professionally. It's hard to say that. Priority two, prepare students. Again, same thing on the Guzman and Duke with their own language here. Prepare students to become engaged alumni. Excuse me. Um, and I like this. We debated on whether or not this should be this high up on the chart or not, but uh, we ended up, the, the VP said, yeah, we're putting them there. Use university-wide standards and best practice to improve the quality for measuring alumni engagement and satisfaction as a priority within a strategic planning contest. How cool, context, how cool is that? You don't see it usually that far up. Usually that's something that's uh, at the bottom or an afterthought. So just to give you a couple of models here. All right, mutual value. We're going to talk about the University of Toronto and what they just put right out on their website. Talk about this. Usually you see mutual value come in the form of professional career related programming. Um, and then I'm going to talk about membership dues. How many people in here still have a dues paying membership program? Raise your hand. Not a lot of hands up. But there's few one up. I saw them. Okay. Um, if we asked that question 20 years ago, half the room would have raised their hand. Um, this, this model is changing. I'm going to show you just one slide on that topic. So let's dive in here. University of Toronto. I'm going to need to walk up to my screen here to be able to read this with my bad 51-year-old eyes. But I'll point your attention to this. They just call it right out on their website. Your lifetime resource, your, your unique relationship with U of T doesn't end when you graduate. In fact, this is the beginning of a lifelong connection to your U of T community putting it right out there. I just like that they're explicit about it, put it right out on their website. Down here, your global U of T network can enrich your life in so many ways. Wherever you are on your personal journey, if you can, U of T is your source of ideas, networking, inspiration, and support, and goes on. The point is they're just putting it right out there, saying this is going to be value to you to be engaged with us. It's not saying come back, make a gift, come back to your reunion, you know, run your chapter, do all the, recruit a student, mentor a student, you know, hire a student. Yes, it's all going to be in here. But they're, what they're saying here is that it's going to help you, too, in your journey, wherever you are in your life. Here's a couple examples of um, in the career, professional programming. So this, this is something that we often talk about, the access to the network. Um, the, the network that is your proprietary group of up to 500,000 I've seen and you know, 5,000 alumni, anywhere in between. I've seen actually a few smaller ones than that. I've seen a couple bigger, to be honest with you. Uh, but access to that network is one of the values that you can offer, a benefit that you can offer to your alumni. Yes, they can get it through LinkedIn, but you can get it in other ways as well. And we'll talk about that for the rest of the conference, frankly, about what graduate can do on that regard. But job postings, coaching, mentoring, webinars, um, I'm going to skip that second to last, but professional affinity groups. Um, these are the uh, entrepreneurship groups. The, um, I work in energy. I am an IT person. What I have found is that the schools that have deployed, not based on your class year, you know, your, your, the four-digit class year, not based on your zip code or your country, but based on the industry that you're in, have had the greatest success of getting alumni to come out. And guess what the reason is? the alumni see value in engaging in that. Because if they're young, they can get hired. If they're mid-career, they can expand their business and their network. And if they're in a senior position and they want to find talent, they're going to go to their alma mater and find talent and be able to hire people. They're using a professional network group based on, on, on definitions that cut across geography and cut across class years. It's based on the industry, finance, Wall Street groups, law groups, entrepreneurship, technology, energy, environment, nursing. I've seen some of those. Depends upon your institution, uh, but all of these can, can have an impact. The one I skipped, I want to just hit on real quick. 
I believe this strongly. If you try to offer career services to alumni, and you hire one person to offer alumni career services, you're chasing the wrong thing, in my opinion. You're chasing the wrong thing, because you can't scale that kind of work that your, that your student career service office might offer to your uh, student population. They're already understaffed trying to serve X thousand students. You have 10 times that, and you bring in one person. The stuff they should be doing is getting access to the network, creating these group webinars and these professional affinity groups. That's my opinion of how to add mutual value in the career realm. Let me show you what Johns Hopkins did. Johns Hopkins and Toronto, both graduate clients, by the way. Um, what they did here in their affinity group section is they set up this web page, and four years ago they had one or two of these, right? And they said, connect with the alums who share your passions, profession, or personal interests through affinity. And a few years ago, Tom Calder's in the room from Hopkins. Where are you, Tom? Where are you, Tom? Anybody else from Hopkins with you? Hey, hello. <laughs> Uh, they, they built this out three, four years ago. They had just a few groups, and over the course of that time, it's grown. I can't even fit them all on the page on the screenshot. Aerospace, arts and entertainment, entrepreneurship, energy, entre uh, federal, my favorite one here. And I asked where this name came from. Can you see the one in the middle? Geeks Rock. The alum who came to them and said, I'm a hardcore programmer guy. We want to do this thing. What do you want to name it? How about Geeks Rock? They came up with that, right? The, the, the alum who was leading it wanted that to be the group, and they have a vibrant, active, active group going. So I just thought that was a cool example of where you can add that kind of value. So here's the do slide I want to show you. I won't tell you which school this comes from because it actually doesn't matter. If you're a dues program in the room, or if you are aware of them, if, you are not, if your alma mater collects dues to be part of a membership of the Alumni Association, I'll bet you pretty close that this is the trend line for your, um, for your dues program based on age. And the way this works, this particular slide, these are people who are 60 years old, the total population of alumni who are 60 years old, about 140,000 people, so it's obviously a large public. And the number of them who are dues payers is the gray bar, which is the 32% and my, no, I spelled the gender wrong and the, the, the flasher is not working, 32.3. So you see the size of the population for each of those age groups are in the blue line and then the gray line getting smaller and by proportion getting down to 7.4%. I did 10 or 11 projects with large publics where we looked at this data and the slope was exactly the same. Down. Younger alumni are not joining dues-based programs anymore. There might be some exceptions in the room. You may have some examples of good stories that you're telling where you've seen that going back up. But the old value added was join the Alumni Association, you'll get all these things. You don't need to join the Alumni Association to get most of those things. In fact, I asked one of the clients, really tell me, what's the benefit I get of joining the Alumni Association? What is the value I get from giving you my $30 this year or my 500 bucks to get a lifetime membership? What's the value? And they thought about it, because this is, remember, I'm just a consultant on the other side of the table, and they're getting interviewed, and they want to give the right answer, and he thought about it, and he said, well, you get a magazine four times a year. Is that magazine available online? Yeah. So, you know, it's not the, that's not a good enough answer anymore. It used to be, but not good enough. Um, should get batteries if we're going to use the pointer for later on. Just point that out. I'm going to keep moving here. Accountability. We talk about this concept of ROE. Anybody know what that stands for? If you've heard me talk before, you know it. But if you don't, return on engagement. Daniel credits me with coining that phrase at the Oxford GLS in 2014. I don't think I was the one who first said that, frankly, but Daniel tells me I am, so I'm going to go with it. But I've used it ever since. ROE, let's demonstrate what that means. You have the work that Gary has chaired, Gary Olson in the room. Gary, stand up so people know who you are and they can see you. Stand up, let people see you. Gary uh, is a former uh, alumni leader at Villanova University for 20, 120 years, what was it? Something like that? Four or five years as the VP for Advancement at the University of Scranton, has now retired and is now functioning as a consultant. And during that time at Scranton and his consulting time, Case hooked him into saying, can you chair this task force and figure out how 3,000 schools or more around the world can measure alumni engagement? We could all do it consistently. So Gary's been heading that effort up for the last few years. I've been honored to be on the task force with him. And tomorrow, he's going to present a 30-minute version of what that, where we are today. So it's exciting where it's going. You all know about net promoter score. Anybody, know, anybody not know NPS or not heard this expression before? You could go to an entire conference. There's an entire book on this topic. We won't be talking too much about it. 
But these are ways that we're looking at overall engagement scores and in correlation of engagement to certain outcomes. I'm going to make sure I spend some time on that. Doing okay, time? Yeah, thank you. Well, this, there we go. Thanks, Michael. All right, perfect. ROE, I love this quote. This is from John Hennessy, the former president, who's a Cornell graduate, by the way, uh, former president at Stanford University. He said, alumni relations is the way you build that emotional tie. He was sort of stream of conscious talking about this to an interview at the Chronicle of Philanthropy. You build that knowledgeable alum who knows about the institution, remains engaged with it for over many years, and this is an investment you make today for the payoff 20 years from now. So there's a president who understands that notion, right? In the times where you, where you have a lot of VPs who are trying to raise X million dollars a year, they're putting their resources to frontline fundraising, and it's not going to the alumni engagement because they don't see the return on the investment or the return on that engagement. Our industry needs to do a better job of demonstrating how we do it. I'm going to show you a couple of slides of how we can begin to do it. This is not the answer. It's an answer. Um, it's one of the ones that I've been encouraging uh, more and more schools to try to look at. Uh, here's an example of another one real quick before we go there. This is Oregon State University. They have this dashboard. They put this out every year. This section I just highlighted shows, is, is a way for them to show the impact that they're doing with the work of their alumni engagement program. But let me show you this slide right here. Oh, and it's cut off at the bottom. Mike, is there any way we can adjust that so we can get those back up? You have to go through the, never mind, we'll do it. I'll just tell you what this is. So let me walk you through it. So donor, event attending, volunteer. This is donor only right here. So at this public university, over the course of four years, dark blue down to lighter blue, their giving rate was 10%, 9.9, 7.4%. 9, this is not uncommon. I think the average giving rate of most public institutions, the old US News and World Report number, is somewhere around 7 or 8% each year. So they were above and they're in the ballpark now. So this is donor only, it got cut off a bit right here. If you take out people who only went to events, right, and said how many of them are donors, you'll see that roughly, in this case, it's almost three times, but twice, usually you see two or three times the rate of them are donors. If they're a volunteer, this is volunteers and donors now, you'll see that it's five times or more. And if they did all three, events, volunteers, and donors. Just interesting data. This is the beginning of showing correlation between an engaged alum, if you consider engagement to be a donor, a volunteer, an event attendee, your donor rates are usually for um, uh, public and private, really, twice the rate of your overall donor population. So if you're at 10%, your event attendees will be at 20. That's just a rough aggregate of lots of schools. But here's what gets interesting. When you look at, here we go, we got this on here now. The average gift, at this institution, the average gift for all donors was 1000 bucks. It was over double that if you went to an event and it was eight, nine, or 10, or even 13 times that if you were a volunteer. It's pretty compelling data. We showed this, these slides, and if you do all three, it's even higher. We showed these slides to a few vice presidents, and one of them coined the term, this is the money slide, not literally the money, but the money slide, in the, in the way that he could use to go to his board and say, here's why I need to invest in my alumni engagement program board. This was the money slide for him, because it told the story in one slide, literally. Here's a private uh, version of that. This works a little better here. Higher giving. It's an elite private university with pretty high giving rate, right? Almost twice, you know, you get to almost three times here, really. But, you know, same thing. But look at, the, look at these dollars. You know, they had an average gift of about 2,000 bucks, three or four, th two or three times that, five times it, and even higher as you get down to the, you do all three. To me, this is the kind of stuff that we should be demonstrating in our industry. We should be doing this routinely. This can be perceived by some as controversial, frankly. Some people look at this and go, whoa, you're crossing that into that third rail category here. You're getting onto that dark side of development. For me, this will help you argue for resources in a way that you couldn't before if you didn't have this kind of data. Um, we'll talk about integration now, and we're going to hit the gas to wrap up in time for Daniel to go. My uh, dear friend and colleague, former colleague at gg &A, he and I worked together. He was at Carnegie Mellon. If you don't follow Andy's blog, Alumni Futures, you should. He's a really good writer. It's down at the very bottom there. Um, oops, sorry. Down here, this is the name of his blog, Alumni Futures. Back three years ago, he wrote, the most obvious place 
for alumni relations and development to combine efforts is an annual giving. Alumni officers and annual giving staff are talking to the same audience as students, their parents and alumni. I love that he wrote this and I put it in bold. Friend raising is dead. Alumni relations and development are, I believe, destined to be more interwoven. And that's a good thing for our donors and our institutions. We set up these internal structures that are annual giving officers, annual giving staff, alumni relations team, alumni associate, all that stuff. Our alumni could give a flip about all those structures, right? If you're an alumni person, you go to, excuse me, you go to an event, they're going to say to you, you're the person who sends me all those solicitations. That inevitably will happen because they, they don't understand the differences that we've set up. This is where the industry is moving. We're getting more integration between things. And I'm going to talk about a few of them here. Yeah, development. I'll hit this quickly, A, B, C, D, and then university-wide. So this is a chart that is supposed to be a continuum from left to right. But what we're talking about here is in the old days, the friend raiser, fundraiser, staunchly separate, the two shall never meet, we're over here. And what's happening, what I found in the industry is that generally speaking, you're moving this way. This is an area I don't want to get to. I think we should still have broad-based engagement. I think there are some points where all alumni do matter, whether they're donors or not. But there are some places that feel that all alumni are equal no matter what, and we're going to treat, treat them that way, and we're going to be friend raisers. I'm not going to ever talk about the fundraising side, but what I see in the industry is more and more moving this direction. I like to see them sort of, really in, sort of in this category right here. Partially to integrate is where I like to see a program appropriately functioning with resources deployed to engage the masses, but some resources in, uh, deployed to engage a key audience. That's what this ABCD thing is here. So this, can, this is controversial. But before I go there, a couple other places. Uh, within development, you can play a role in the advancement strategy, aligning with the university. We'll talk about that in a second. Define the role in a campaign. Market segmentation is this ABD thing, ABCD thing that we'll talk about in a moment. But here are a couple of examples. I love these two slides. These are two institutions that um, put it right out there. University of Nottingham, look what they did here. Help us raise 200 million pounds or become one of our 1,000 volunteers. Look at these two big buttons. These two big buttons, donate now, give your time. Very clear that the two things were equal and important to them. Another thing outside the US where they do this better than what we do, I think, is University of British Columbia. They said in 2011, UBC publicly launched the most ambitious fundraising and alumni engagement campaign in Canadian history. Look at the two things they put together, fundraising and alumni engagement. And the results they put up, yeah, we raised $1.6 billion, but we also uniquely engaged 130,000 of our 317,000 alumni. Um, that's a pretty unique thing to have out there in public. This was a public, that's just an internal metric. They, they had a website that tracked it and they showed it and I, think, I thought it was brilliant. So here's ABCD. Forewarning here. If you are an alumni relations purist, you're gonna probably be offended by these next two slides. However, I found that in the context of an Ivy League institution that's raising $700 million a year, we had 53 people deployed doing alumni relations work in the center, in the colleges and schools there were more, that if we didn't develop a common language with our development colleagues and get them to see us as equals and working with them as partners, we were never going to be able to sustain that kind of investment. So what we developed was this language we called ABCD. So for for over 100 years, I would say that Cornell was in a very separate, you know, that staunchly separate category on the left of that continuum. The new the VP came in, Charlie Flager, in 2006 and began to put a collaborative spirit in place where they started to work together. When I arrived in 08, the alumni office was up on the campus and the rest of the entire advancement staff was down in this gorgeous new building just off campus. And he asked me to help in my five years there to partially integrate to an integrated model when I left in 2013, the person they put in place of me now oversees alumni engagement and the annual fund. That's an example of an evolution of one institution. But here's the ABCD model. This is where the purists are going to get mad and throw rocks. But what this did is it established a common language internally with our principal gift officers, our major gift officers, our annual giving colleagues. They all understood what we meant when we said this was an A event, a B event, a C event, whatever. They knew what these words meant, so we knew how to plan. So a lot on this first click here, but let me walk you through it. A, let's start from the bottom. D, future donors. This is the masses. These people are not currently donors in the database in any way, so zero. C, we're the annual fund donors. Any of our volunteers, we threw our volunteers in there, even if you weren't a donor, we threw them in there. But a dollar to 100,000 is the level that Cornell was at. These numbers can change based on your institution. 
principal gift prospects and I'm sorry, this should say major gift prospects and annual giving pro annual fund donors 100k to 1 million, and principal gift is correct up here, and high level major gift prospects 1 million plus. In fact, the principal gift was 10 million at Cornell. It's crazy some of the numbers they have. But when we broke this down, so this is what I call, I wrote a paper on this called The Development Lens on Alumni Relations. Never published it because I knew how the, the alumni relations in, industry could react. I could be vilified if this went out in public. So I, I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants it. I'm, I shared it with Daniel recently. He said it was brilliant. But um, he said that everything I do, he says, is brilliant. We're going to publish it? All right, so we'll see it on the graduate site sometime. But here's where it gets controversial, right? But let me just, if you took any population, no matter where you draw your lines and where you put your numbers, whether you use letters or something else, here's what it looks like. Look at the right. Two-thirds of our alumni population were never or not donors at that time. So if you purely wanted to engage alumni, you could arguably say, we're not going to worry about these. Around the, if you had the development lens on now, right? You're now a development lens looking alumni relations professional. You're going to say, what do we do with that depopulation? Hold that thought for a second. We had 60,000, 27% is right where our donor number was, somewhere between 27 and 32 each year. And then it got down to this 12,000. And then the, the, I love this number because it actually worked out to be this, the 1%, the 3,000 households who can make a transformational gift in a campaign context. But what this did, when we were planning, do we have homecoming and reunion and regional chapter events? Yes, yes, yes. Those are A, B, C, D events, and everybody knew that. But when we were planning the Cornell Entrepreneurship Network event in New York City, and the speaker is Andrew Ross Sorkin, who just wrote the book Too Big to Fail during the economic crisis. And he's, an, he's a Cornell graduate. He's on CNN all the time now. So VIP person, in a v, Cornell grad, in a VIP room who just wrote the hottest book at, in 2009. Who are you going to invite to that? Every alum who lives in New York City? or your top prospects. We call that our A-B event. And we planned that in the alumni office and had a Cornell Entrepreneurship Network event for the A and B audience, did it again, A and B audience in New York City. And we had that room sold out in the first email. We had gift officers clamoring to be in the room with us for that. Right? You have, you know, usually gift officers don't want to go to the alumni stuff. They, were, they wanted a spot in that room because all the people were there. Let me make it clear. I would estimate. We didn't like, have a budget line that told me this number, but if I had to estimate, 20 to 25% of my resources were deployed to A, B group. The others were C, the other 80% C's and D's. We still did homecoming. We still did broad-based stuff. But when we had a reunion of 7,000 people and Chuck Feeney was coming back to campus, Atlantic Philanthropies, he's given Cornell over a billion dollars. Just the grand opening of the Cornell Tech Campus in New York City happened in the last couple of days. He gave $100 million just to that. No, I'm sorry. Bloomberg gave the $100 million to that um, as the mayor of New York, not as a Hopkins grad, Tom. Don't get upset. He was the mayor giving that money out. But uh, uh, Chuck Feeney gave $300 million in cash to get that bid for us to win that. He was coming to his reunion. He wasn't going to be in the beer tent with everybody else dancing and doing polkas, right? We were going to feature him on the stage being interviewed by the president with 2,000 alums talking to him about how he built duty-free shops. That's an A strategy in an ABCD event. All it did was allowed us to internally have a language to be able to communicate that, and everybody knew what we were talking about when we said it. I don't know where they're, what they're doing with it today, but that's, we had that in place. My last two years, this was working pretty well, and then I left. Let's see what they're doing now. I don't know. A couple last things here. So this is integration university-wide. This is actually a, a chart. The colors were different, but I went with purple for graduate. But we actually estimated on the chart here of how this institution was integrated with their alumni engagement approach across all these important partners on campus, right? So if you, in the center, if you wanted a university alumni engagement strategy, their alumni association was right there, right? Student affairs, university relations, athletics, college and schools, development over here, admissions, career services, they are all playing a role. All of you would probably acknowledge that these are your probably most important partners on any college campus, even true in K through 12 setting that these are critical partners to have. But they had maybe dotted lines of some of these, but some of them were, if I had to really draw it to scale, that some of these would be off over here. You wouldn't even see them because they didn't talk to the career service officer. They had, they had a fight going on with them. Um, uh, where's enrollment? Admissions. They, the, the leader of the alumni program's predecessor, 
and the same predecessor on the admissions side were like mortal enemies. So there was no collaboration between the alumni and the admissions office, yet the admissions office, ready for this? You're going to resonate with many people in the college side. The admissions offices was managing 1,000 volunteers who helped interview students for applications and get them to come, right? The alumni office didn't know who they were. They never worked with them. There was no training. There was nothing. They were doing their own rogue. And I have a couple heads nodding down front. They understand that this happens, right? So this was a mess. So we built this strategy about what should it look like and what does it mean? How do we get to this point? And we use this visual. Say it should look like this. You should have everybody playing a role to bring a university-wide alumni engagement strategy. And my good friend Paul Rucker is going to talk about this tomorrow in our panel discussion. But what they've done at the University of Washington, purple for what? Not the right purple, though, but for you guys, but Paul has a really good way of thinking about how, does, how do these come together at a university? And they've, they've spent the last several years building a model that's really cool. In, in a um, large public university, this is a key one, where you have college and schools, a business school, a law school, and so on that may have their own alumni program. If they're not lined up with what's happening at the center, that could be a huge problem. And what they've done at Washington has been amazing. I think that's my last slide. So I'm going to stop here and say, as a recap, you know, th again, these are not the only trends. There's many others. You heard me reference a few during the course of this talk. Um, I'm doing good on time. I'm going to give you a little extra here. <laughs> um, but strategic planning, I think, is critical. Um, you should be thinking two, three years ahead at most. If you go beyond three years, things will change so much, especially if you throw in digital and social kind of stuff in there because the world changes every year in that area. But you should have a, a, a plan that looks ahead three years. And that model we showed is a good one to use for yourself, but also managing a board's involvement in a strategic planning process. Um, the mutual value proposition, I think, is something that should bleed into your language. It should be on websites. It should be things. When you give an internal report, you should be talking about how this not only helps us, but it helps our alums. And if we do that, they're going to be more engaged. Accountability, if this train hasn't hit you already, it's going to. This is going to keep coming. We have to be better as an industry of showing the value of our work and what the return on engagement really is. So I, I implore you to start to have us. So I met with um, Tonya from the University of Toronto Engineering School before, and she developed a report that does some of this correlation work between uh, engagement and giving. Where are you, Tonya? Where's your paper? There you are. Can people come and look at your paper, get a glimpse? <laughs> She developed a report. It's, it's in a draft form, but I just flipped through it in two seconds and said, this is it. Just so I know that I can see that there's visuals in there that's connecting the dots between these things. So that's the kind of stuff we should be thinking about in this integration concept. Um, uh, let's take it beyond just advancement, friend raising, fundraising going away. Let's take it into a whole other level. and Let's, let's morph into this evolutionary stage where the alumni relations shop becomes so integral to the success of the institution in recruiting students to come there, admissions partnership, and making sure students are having a great experience, student affairs sponsor, partnership. You throw athletics in there as well. Um, but also making sure our students get internships and jobs. That's a career service partnership. But you need university relations or marketing communications to do that. You need to be plugged in with a development team and so on. Those are the circles I showed in that previous slide. That's where we need to get as an industry, to become indispensable to those units. You will never have to argue for resources in your shop, again, if you make yourself indispensable to all those circles I showed around that big one, because they'll see the value you provide. And please be here for tomorrow's discussion, because Paul does a way better job of describing this uh, than I ever will about what they've done at University of Washington as a real model that you can look at. So I will stop there. You were polite, didn't ask any questions, um, maybe just because it's after lunch and we're all tired. And, but are there any comments or questions or thoughts, reactions to this? Anybody want to share any thing? Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Stand by. There are microphones up here, right near you, Bob. If you don't mind. Most of your examples were from. Most of your U.S. examples were from Pequot institutions. Other successful models in K through 12 programs. Oh, absolutely, yes. And I, I should have put in some more, you know, now that you say, I knew that, as you started to say the sentence, I knew what was coming out of your mouth, given what you are doing right now. These same things apply in um, K through 12, in small liberal arts colleges. These concepts are universal. I'd put any one of these across uh, and say that they apply in even nonprofit settings that these all would apply as well. If you want to press me right now on some specific examples, I will decline because I'll insult somebody in the room. 
but offline, if you want to come to me, I'll, sh I'll show you. We worked with eight or nine K through 12 schools, and there's three or four of them. They're doing some really cool things in each of these areas. I'm happy to share those with you, Bob. But good point. I appreciate it. It's good feedback, actually. Got to remember that. You got to keep me honest on that. My wheelhouse, obviously, was these uh, college universities for all these years. And K through 12 was relatively new for me. Comments or questions? Oh, go ahead. So the question was, how often should a board meet throughout the year? Um, if you want a real honest answer to that question, my honest answer in this room is zero. <laughs> All of you, if you really did an honest gut check, you would agree with that answer. I spent five years wrestling with board presidents and people. Um, the average is three. Two is probably the minimum. One is not enough. Four is getting to be a lot. I've heard six. I've seen monthly, 12 a year. I would shoot myself. I would never take a job <laughs> that had 12 meetings a year of their board. So, so three is probably the right number. Two or three would be what I would suggest you do. Getting your board leader to agree that it needs to be less meetings a year is the way to do it. Make it there, his or her idea, uh, to reduce the number of meetings. We've had some clients successfully uh, complete that transition. But um, four years is a challenge because they're going to be thinking about you know, there's a quote I have in a different deck, and it talks about, we want our board not helping the alumni leader in what's happening in the next six weeks. We want them thinking about what the next three years look like. So what, even at four meetings a year, if you go back to that pyramid and you keep them at the vision, mission, priority conversation, then I think you're going to be an easier time working with that board versus them down in the, okay, where should we have this next event? Should we go to London or should we go to Singapore? Or, that's not their decision. You live it every day. You're on the team, right? You're coming in. They're coming from the outside. You don't go to their office and say, hey, I think we should prosecute this case differently, you know, the, the law version of it. Or I think we should invest in this, not in that. Because I, I saw this thing on my way into the meeting today, which is what you get with a lot of boards, right? They, they see and feel like they think they're experts. This is a field that we are all experts in. So you should be able to keep them up at that top level. Now, the, the exception to that would be, if you have somebody on your team who's like a uh, uh, head at Google or works at Facebook or LinkedIn and you're developing a social media strategy, I would let them down in that pyramid down to the tactics. Help us figure this out. So, but you giving them permission to do that is the only exception. The rest of it is up at the top. I'm going to have to draw. I went in the cut sign from above. And my light's flashing. 19 seconds, 20 seconds over, 22 seconds over. Thank you all very much. Appreciated the time. <laughs>